Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the special meeting of the Wheatfield Town Board for this date, which is the 12th day of January 2015. We have only one item before us. As we finish, if any board members wish to uh, add anything or bring anything else up, they may do so. But we have one item on the agenda for this evening, and that is hopefully to pass a final scoping document regarding the uh, cobblestone development. Uh, Drew Riley is here again this evening, and Drew is going to take us through where we go this evening. So, Drew, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, sir. As you know, over the last month, over a month, you've been dealing with, with uh, scoping. It's an optional part of the feature, but I always recommend it when you're doing an impact statement. The applicant will want to know what you want studied and how you want to study. We had a public information meeting. From my understanding, at last meeting was last Monday. Yep. Um, you've got some additional comments. I apologize if I got some of those comments late. I tried to incorporate those. You've got a copy in the in email to you with highlighted changes in there. And the gist of the highlighted changes were we wanted some information uh, clarified. We got some great photos from the residents so we can provide to the drainage consultant and your consultant to make sure they understand the situation. <coughs> Uh, incorporated and also make sure that I think one of the important things that was brought up is that uh, when you have a meeting with the police department and uh, there was the fire department in the school district that you have a town board representative there so you hear from them exactly what those issues are the applicant and you understand what the issues are and that's clearly understood in the in the draft environmental impact statement uh, there are still questions raised about um, the animals that may exist on the site we got some pictures uh, I have incorporated that in the environmental settings document. It will be something that the applicant will document. I know they have something on record already from Fish and Wildlife, but it'd be good to document those situations on the record there. And one other issue was just some clarification of, as you know, one of the issues is the filling of the site, and we gave them some specific locations to run uh, their cross section <coughs> so you get an idea of how that filling and what it's going to look like from the rear yard to the existing residence back to the property. So I've incorporated some of those comments into the document, try to clarify some situations. The bottom line is we're asking you to adopt the scoping document. It is a, like I said, an informal but formal process that gives them direction. What do you use that scoping document for? When the draft environmental impact statement is submitted to you, before you actually release it and continue with the process, you use that scoping document to say, did they study the things that you asked them to study the way you wanted them to study? As I put my hand out tonight, that's an important part of the process. If they don't do what you've asked them to do, uh, then you reject that document. And you keep rejecting that document until they do what you've asked them to do. Once the document is accepted, then the scoping document becomes a moot point, then you move forward with formal reviews, public hearings, hiring specialists to help you review that, make changes. And all those things are then finalized in your FEIS, which I always mention in my secret training, the difference between a DEIS and an FEIS, DEIS most of the time represents the applicant's opinion. The FEIS must represent your opinion. So you can do, you can have all of your opinions placed in that and your specialty reviews placed in that document. So um, that's the big difference. So tonight, I'm here to answer any questions that you have about that scoping document. Uh, we'd like them to move forward I think the big question you have, and let's, hit, let's get right to that question, is the typical process that I explained before is that the applicant does the DEIS, then you hire your experts and, and do your reviews and, and make provisions through that through the FEIS. Uh, and one of the things you considered was, well, why do I want to see the same traffic study and the same grain study I saw before? We haven't found them adequate. Why don't we go out and hire right from the beginning? And you put that at the end of your scoping document. The question that's been raised is, the secret law is very specific about you can charge fees to review or complete an environmental impact statement. It says you can't do both. So by doing both, the applicant is questioned and, and you have to look at the unique situation. Can you do some of it and review some of it together? If you work with them enough, you may be able to do that or you can just pull that out. The standard way is, like I said, standard doesn't mean always right. But the standard way is you let the applicant do the DEIS. You're not going to get the same traffic study and the same drainage study because you've been very articulate articulated in your, in your scoping document. If they submitted the same traffic study and drainage study, I'm here to stand here and tell you, you would reject it because it doesn't meet the requirements of the scoping document. So 
So we're hoping that they redo it, redo the drainage study and the traffic study to what you've asked them to do. Then you would hire your outside expert to take a look at those documents and set after you've accepted that they did what you asked them to do. And we do, they can look at the model, redo the model, comment on the fact that you don't like how they don't like how they did it, redo some of the things, and then that all can be addressed in the FDIS. But I always said that, and I got myself in trouble at the first meeting. That's typically how it's done. That the developer will do his job with, a, with to try to prove why the project does not have an environmental impact. You though have the upper hand in reviewing that document because you must agree with it then or make your own decisions in that FDIS. So that's the big question tonight. I think the applicant has asked. I think we've addressed the public's issues and and other people who have commented. Um, but the applicant has actually removed that last statement in the in the scoping document that they would like their chance to meet the requirement, do the entire DEIS, and then you go out and hire your consultant. Questions of the board? You know, it's kind of a, I said to Bob, the speaker law is a very, it, it lets you do things different ways, but when you create a law that allows people to do different ways, what do you do? You create conflict, you create questions about it. If everybody does did the same thing on all projects, on all speaker stuff, then it'd be easy, but because it's flexible, people do things different ways. So if they do the study and they yeah. do their study and then we <coughs> review it, right. and if we hire outside experts, and if we do the review and we, if we come up with some discrepancies or things that we need further clarification on, right. does that mean they have to redo pieces of what they did? Or, or Good who? question. In an FDIS, if there's something wrong in the DEIS, you can make that statement and make those corrections. I'm not saying that it's guys. wrong, but oh. they, maybe they didn't answer it the way we were expecting right. the answer to and come. I, and I said that at the first meeting. <laughs> Mr. Lippis got, got me. I said, applicants will try with their consultants to, to, to make a project what they believe is environmentally sound. So you, you, 99 times out of 100, you're going to get a, uh, those that report in the DEIS saying, we've done everything we believe we've mitigated to the maximum effect. Right? That's where you step in, and the FDIS is different. You get to make your statements on the record through your experts, through your reviews. No, we don't agree with this. This assumption was wrong. We plugged this in. This doesn't work this way. This has this impact. And you control what goes in the FDIS. And then you have that level of information. You have what the applicant presented, your information. And then, like I said, this whole thing is about making a decision at the end. With those two pieces of information, you make a rational decision in your findings. So I see it all the time. Something is submitted, and you make changes through your experts and whatever thing we disagree. You can have the applicant make changes, like it was a, a strictly a model thing, like a drainage report will say, hey, you made the wrong assumption here. Put this assumption into the model. Or you can just have the model, and you make changes to it, or your consultant makes changes to it, say, <coughs> this is the answer we got. We disagree with that answer. Okay? So I think you're protected either way. I think the applicant has offered, well, if you really want, we'd like to work out how you're going to do that. But the standard way is let them produce the DEIS. They are not going to submit the same drainage and traffic study. We, we would clearly reject it if they did. And you can reject it as many times as you want. If they're not listening, you just keep rejecting and the process doesn't go forward. Um, but you know, that, I've seen that happen. But they have to do what's been asked, and then you hire your experts to make those changes to represent your opinion. Okay. What happens if we reject it? Then you start with another scoping document, or no, how, you, what's you the procedure? It based upon that scoping document, you, when you reject a DEIS as incomplete, you have to list in your resolution: this is what you have not done correctly that we asked you to do. Please redo it. Um, it's not whether you agree or disagree with the findings of the DEIS. You're rejecting it because. We asked you to do this type of traffic study, and you did not do that. And you specifically put that in your rejection. And we teach that to communities a lot because a lot of times they just say, we reject the DEIS. The law says you must articulate what is deficient. You're saying that, that DEIS is deficient. You didn't, didn't do what we asked you to do. We asked for line of sight drawings. You didn't do that. You didn't submit any line of sight drawings. We asked you to study the parking situation, school, and speak to the school. You didn't do that. You're rejecting it. It was deficient. The document did not meet the scoping document. So you don't have to redo the scoping document. You basically tell them it's deficient. Now the other issue is if something comes up in a DEIS that you did not think about because of the information that's garnered, doesn't mean you cannot address that issue in the FDIS. And that's been done too, where something comes 
comes up in a draft impact statement that you didn't think about. Geez, this, this kind of got me thinking about it. I think this is, a, this is a problem here. You can have that addressed in an FBIS. If it was a large enough problem, a real big mess, you can ask for, for what they call supplemental environmental impact statement. But typically, we can address it in the FBIS. See how complicated it gets? There are many different things that can happen through this process. It is a long process with a lot of steps to it. I handed out that those 15 kind of steps. It's, but it's, it's a good process. It's a balanced process if you follow that process. And like I said, the hard part is when you get it in, then you have to make a rational decision on the record based upon that information. Any other questions of the board? Basic, basically, if I understand you correctly, what you did with the <coughs> scoping document is you took everybody's opinions and everybody's written ideas and everything that came to your attention from us, from the folks on the floor or from the engineering yourselves, and put it all in there and you want an answer to each one of those right. issues there, or studies where studies are covered. There were three issues at the end of the scoping document, which is kind of a good thing in the scoping document, that were things brought up that you are not going to address in the DEIS. I put three things at the end. There was one mention in one of the meetings about doing a two-year wildlife study. We're not doing a two-year wildlife study. There was a mention about economic impacts, and unfortunately, my opinion, you can look it up if you can't look at economic impacts. Okay. And then there was one other issue. Did we have it? Agriculture. Agricultural, yeah. Very difficult thing. I point out to the board, you have an agricultural protection plan being worked on. You're going to be changing law, rules and laws, I'm sure, and doing other things in response to the agricultural protection plan. But as of right now, be difficult to ask them to do an agricultural study because the plan is not in it's not in a state ag district, it's not agriculturally zoned land, and it's in, it's in accordance with the conference plan of where you want to develop. If you're going to change that in the future, change in the future. That was my strong opinion. It's very difficult to do an agricultural study when all your documents say that that is zoned correctly, your conference plan says that's where development is, and it's not your agricultural protection area. It's very difficult to just get back now and say, do an agricultural protection, to do an agricultural analysis. What are they going to analyze? Because if you had something in your document saying we wanted to protect that land for agriculture, then they would. So those were the three things that I said, my, my opinion, and I presented to you for the last month and a half. And I don't think those issues you could address in the DEIS. <coughs> they initially said that the site was balanced, that they weren't going to be bringing any more fill in them. <coughs> so no fill in, no fill out. Right. But if they, so if they were to unbalance the site, essentially the maybe lower the property, uh, do, do we give them the leeway in this scoping document so that if they want to lower the height of their subdivision, they have, they have that opportunity to do we, that? We gave them a bunch of different ideas, ideas for mitigation as an alternative. We gave them a big open that you can change the layout, what, whatever, whatever the best. But under mitigation, we talked about changing grading and fill and how much fill you need. So okay. that's one of the things we've asked them to look at. I'm sure they would like to look at, too. We insisted that they look at the fill issue. We'd like to, and it's that balance, minimize as much of the fill as possible, but also meeting the requirements. But being balanced problem. wasn't a requirement of the town. Right. Okay. Is there compaction tests on the fill? <clears throat> uh, we talk about this, so they're going to do a soil analysis on, on the type of material that they're going to put in there. That was put in the scoping document. They would give an idea of what the well, soils are. Compaction documentation. Well, that'll be done <coughs> if this project ever goes forward. They they do that as a as a norm. They don't have to anyways as part of the uh, the floodplain changes because <coughs> in order to get a, a letter of map revision to remove the property from the floodplain, they're going to have to document adequate compaction. And I think that's yes. one. It's a good it's a good question um, because the yes. Yes. compaction. They'll have to hire somebody to use it for that KD or something. So they're there 24 when they're on there.
once they have those soils, that would be construction plans that move, you know, that those are being impacted correctly. Or, you know, we want to know first, are there soils on site where you're getting that there can be places that fill materials and meet those requirements? That we don't find out later that we got to bring in thousands of truckloads of material from off site because <coughs> So some of that Hopefully fill will, that. some of that fill <coughs> that they're going to be using will be from that pond they're digging? Hopefully, yeah. And depending on how deep they go, to see if it's suitable, if it's clay. Suitable for those types of filling operations. Those are good questions. And other issues, when you get those results, other issues may come up, and that's where you can address them in the FDIS also. Never be afraid to say, that's the purpose of the DEIS, is generating information, things that you don't know now, that you might know through the DEIS, and say, hey, this raises another concern or a problem that we, that we did not see before. All of a sudden, the soils are all poor. Now you have an issue of having to bring in lots of material to the site, which is a very different issue than taking materials off the site. And going through all the emails and all my notes from the meetings, there was one thing that Doug Sigmund mentioned about hedgerows or something. Right. It, 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 there wasn't there a hedgerow that you were concerned about? Tree line that uh, I own half of. I just want to make sure it's in there because you know, once a bulldozer. And that tree line that's blocked somewhere. <coughs> We've asked them to identify all those existing tree lines, and then one of the mitigations is to avoid what you've asked for, and we're going to tell them they have to show in their plans that they're avoiding those those tree lines and keeping them in place. In previous then meetings, we already in. agreed to that. Right. I just don't know right. because this is happening if it's going to change. And that's a very good thing. What comes out of an FDIS a lot of times, too, is the project tends to see. <coughs> One of the things in that finding statement is all those conditions you're going to place on the approval of the site, which would go to the conditions of, you know, preserving that tree line, uh, doing extra compaction tests or whatever could be reasonable findings within your finding document, which then is used to make your decisions on the project. So that's the great thing about when an EIS is used correctly is it's a process, you know, that generates information to make rational decisions. Okay. Thank you for those points. Those were good points. Supervisor. One. Supervisor. I got one question on the uh, Mr. Parko. On the drainage on the it says downstream, but it was brought up about upstream or the impact wasn't upstream. It's not written in written in the scope. You have a you only have a word of downstream. There's a few spots. I'm just checking. We want them to analyze the whole watershed, which would include the upstream areas. We targeted downstream because we typically know that's the problem, but they do have to identify the drainage sheds and what's upstream of it. And if that creates a problem or an alternative, right, we want them to look at the whole drainage shed, which includes upstream, upstream and downstream. Well, the truth is if the town starts cleaning ditches yeah. upstream last Sunday when I went down Steed Road, everybody, there was water, everybody back in their houses. 50 feet off the back of their house, if that ditch was open properly, that all that water would all flow there. Well, that's so the problem you know, when you do right ditching for like them, if you don't start at the upper end, you start at the lower end because if yeah. you clean up, you know. Because right now it's all restrained, but if the town does what you say they're going to do open ditches, right. that, you know, there's a lot of water sitting there. It does state in the area and downstream on the first page. So I would say that would that's addressed. Thank you. 
I could clarify that as well, but it's required in the state yeah. law. I mean, any drainage group any has, as you, as you point out, SWIFT, you have to meet quality and quantity. So well, they, yeah. they have to address that issue. Yeah. And they may address it differently. Matter of fact, we've asked them to look at alternatives. It could be great in here. You can have bioretention swales and all those different things to take care of the sure. quality. According to the plan, I right. looked at them thoroughly, they right. could not cover storm water pollution. Right. Yeah. And, and let's talk about it. It's a very good point I, I made earlier at previous meetings. Take the plans that exist now and set them aside because the DEIS is going to create the plan that hopefully is environmentally impacts the environment. Hopefully there will. If the process is done correctly, the plan will change it and be included, done better. But right now it's not included. I would tell people, if you're doing an impact statement and don't think the result is going to be a change of project or a better project, that's typically why you issue a positive deck. If the project proposed has potentially an impact on the environment. There will be changes to that project. If it's included, but right. right now it's not included. True. I can clarify that. It's included by state law, but if it's yeah. more than yeah. once, well, I can just clarify that, there, that it will address federal law. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Anything over an acre, uh, yeah. Tim, right, you, you have to submit a storm plan. They have, they they have, have they, anything over an acre, which it will be. There's, there's no option. They have to. Yeah, they have to. There's nothing been disturbed there, to my knowledge, other than maybe that little ditch that was filled in. That the law states application process. The application is already begun. Right. They, they have to, and again, I don't want to, uh, before they issue a preliminary plat approval, you have to have those things yeah. in place. There's been no preliminary plat approval on the project. There's been no, no to the point of that. They may have done preliminary SWIFT applications, but obviously until you do your approvals, you can't apply for a SWIFT. Um, so just a clarification. Now, our specs now, Tim, we require the hydrodynamic units, if that's the right word for it. That's, that's a piece of it. So the, the hydrodynamic units are for pretreatment in front of a wet pond. So there's all different, the, the stormwater regulations that are being referred to have all different prescribed methods for meeting the water quality treatment requirements. Wet ponds are one way to meet the water quality requirement. Prior to a wet pond, you either need a floor bay, it's like the, the initial right. treatment for all the sediment, or you need a hydrodynamic unit. The town has gone to requiring hydrodynamic units. They're more expensive for the developers, but they're easier for the town to maintain because the, the floor bays tend to silt in. We, we had issues and then right. you, know, you get older. So we require hydrodynamic units now. That's to protect the water going into the wet pond, and that's how the water quality is treated. But there's also, Drew was referring to bioretention, <coughs> over the last few years the regs have changed to where in addition to treating quantity from a peak standpoint and quality that's being talked about with the SWIFT, you also now have to retain the water so that your volume under a certain storm is not increasing. So you have to disconnect you know, we've talked about this with all the subdivisions. You have to disconnect the rooftops. Instead of them going into the um, uh, under drains, they're supposed to spill out on the yards if you can do that. Now, in the town, there's only certain times when we can do that, you know, because of the soils. They have to be able to go right to a, a ditch or something, or it can create issues. Or bioretention, as Drew talked about, um, rain gardens, things like that, where you're promoting the water to infiltrate into the ground as opposed to uh, running off. <coughs> As a clarification, the gentleman's report, I'll just add, if you want in your resolution, a clarification the drainage report will include analysis of quality. So just make sure, I mean, we know what's gonna happen, but just make sure that it's in there. I, I don't have a problem with that, it's just clarifying. I love clarifying things, because the, the applicant will always come back and say, can you clarify this, what are you asking for? I might as well clarify right here that the drainage report is addressing quantity, all these things we're asking for, but also addressing quality. And as we say in the mitigation section, he's going to look at green infrastructure things to also improve quality. So, yeah. 
On, uh, on drainage, the front page of the Tribune had a nice picture of Eric Road and the flooding, and it was in the winter conditions. I just want to, is the drainage report going to not just look at, you know, a rain occurrence in the middle of July, but is it going to look at something in January or February where the ground's frozen, you have a major snow melt, <clears throat> and there's nowhere for the water to go in the ground because the ground's frozen, <clears throat> so it's going to go into all the ditches and streets. We've asked for a Can, year, I clarified, I used old, old engineering language, I call it pre-wetting Oh, is that, that's what that is? Yeah, that, okay. that happens when the ground is already soaked or the ground has nowhere for water to go, what's happening on the property. Which you have that situation, a lot of the property is already flooded. You're also looking at the idea of removing that, that area that's going to be filled, and we're looking at that also. But yeah. pre-wet is frozen, they don't usually do frozen, they just pre-wet it means there's no more water going to be going on the ground anyway. Okay. Frozen is a difficult issue. My backyard was really like a lot of I just didn't understand. Oh, I didn't understand it pre. Like it was yeah, the terminology I wasn't used to. I didn't know that pre-wetted meant that the ground wasn't had any more capacity right. to hold. Right. And isn't this study dependent upon a hundred-year flood, not a ten-year flood? We've asked them to specifically look at the, the hundred-year storm event, which they have to anyway. But we're asking specifically look at it. What are the implications when a hundred-year storm comes along? And I believe um, I think Tim's pointed out uh, uh, that. 100-year storm event has changed, and they have to make sure they get the updated number. I believe that number has changed since the original drainage study. There's a bigger number now, obviously, with all the different weather conditions. So yeah. they need to check on that, and we'll check on that to make sure they're using the most recent 100-year storm event. Does anybody else have anything that they think we are missing at this point? Mr. Palumbo? Supervisor, again, Jeff Palumbo from Damon Mori. Just a couple of things. Um, first of all, a couple of times in the document, there's a sentence that says, include in the analysis the impacts of an existing approved subdivision, any existing approved subdivision with future phases and subdivisions in the planning process. I think if you take that sentence literally, then we'd only be examining approved subdivisions with future phases. I don't know that that's what you want. I think you really want us to do any approved subdivision, whether or not it has future phases. I think a literal reading could limit that from your perspective. Uh, so where, is, where is it? Sir? It's um, number five under 3.0, and it's also in number eight. Yeah, I'm. Well, saying those subdivisions that that have already been approved that have future phases, obviously that impact this, and then any subdivisions in the planning process right now that may have been approved but they're before. No, the no. The, the the way to the the way to clarify it is to change uh, the word with to including. Yeah, okay. approved subdivisions would do it. I'm just pointing that out that you don't want to limit yourselves on that issue. But I do have an objection to the second half of that sentence, subdivisions in the planning process. Typically, we would not study subdivisions that have not been approved for a variety of reasons. You know, we, that would require us to determine whether they're in the sketch plan stage, the preliminary plat, the final plat, where are they, and we don't know if that will ever take place. So typically, we would only study those subdivisions that have been approved by the town, but not those that are in the planning process. Um, so I'd ask you to consider that. And the other comment, Drew has pointed out, the uh, final note on the document itself, um, as Drew correctly pointed out, the, the project sponsor has the choice on whether or not the lead agent prepares the DEIS or the project sponsor himself. If the project sponsor had chosen the town to prepare the, lead, the um, DEIS, then you could properly charge us for these things that you're talking about, potentially. But since we chose to do it ourselves, we're preparing the DEIS, it becomes our document. And the board loses the authority to direct to us what consultants to use, because then it wouldn't be our document. It would be your document. But we chose to prepare the document. So in terms of what Drew said earlier, I agree with. Um, the way it should work is we will prepare the DEIS, we will update the traffic study and the drainage studies and all the other studies that you've asked us to conduct. 
we'll submit it to you. You would re send it to whatever independent consultant you'd like to, to uh, analyze and review, and you can properly charge us a fee under Seeker for that review, but not direct us which consultants to use and then direct us to pay for those. So we'd ask that that note be eliminated. Thank you. Pardon me? Can I ask you a question? Sure, sure, certainly. Is it your intention to use the same persons or groups that you had previously? I think so. I think we'll probably use the same ones and, um, and because we're confident that their studies were accurate and they'll be updated to reflect the information that's been requested. Isn't that sort of counterproductive, expecting a different result from the same group during the review of those Well, there, there's never been an identification that anything was incorrect about what those studies showed. There's no, no identification. What's the basis for making the claim that the studies were done incorrectly? There is none. In fact, just the opposite exists. Your own town engineer accepted those studies and recommended that the board issue a negative declaration. Doesn't the town board just kind of more or less take a look at it and say the way you did it was right? I'm not following. What, what the... What? Do they review every little piece of information you have, or do they take a look at what you arrived at and said, yeah, it's the, the way they went about it to arrive at this conclusion? There's, there's several different answers to that question. The first part of the answer is that when we submit the draft DEIS, it's the lead agent, your responsibility, to determine whether or not the document is complete. Again, not necessarily that you agree with the conclusions of our report, just that we've addressed all the issues that you've asked us to address. The second part of the question is, then you then take that, I don't expect the town board to do an analysis of the drainage, I would expect that you would bring it to a consultant and have him review, have them review our documents, both in terms of the drainage and the traffic, and then have them take a look at the minutia in the document that most of us don't even understand and, and provide guidance to the board. And for that, you can charge us. And if we need further analysis or further detail, we can come back and... Absolutely. And Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's where you're protected because the, the study is going to be different. I mean, the, the standard study was done before. You've identified and the public has identified that this is not a standard situation. You've asked for a, a lot of different stuff to be done. Um, they're going to present all that new information come back the same and say we don't think they don't think it's an impact they're fairly confident in that but then you're going to hire your independent consultant to look at that and and go through that and, and analyze it even further so you're protected on all ways i think you're you're fine with that like i said you're not going to get the same drainage study you're not going to get the same traffic study you got before if they just repackage the same study i'll tell you right now it's going to be rejected because it doesn't and, 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 and we know that's not going to happen because we know it would be rejected Thank you. Any yeah. other questions for me? The max that we can charge is based upon the value of the land plus the value of the infrastructure that's put onto the land. Correct. The how percentage, do we get, the how do we get those numbers? As soon as you request it from us, we'll provide it. Did we come up with an answer for point number five subdivisions in the planning process? Yeah, we're going to, to change the word with to including. And I think there's somewhere, there's a, it's the same thing on another part of the document, but I don't... Number eight on the same page is the same thing. I saw with, but the subdivisions in the planning process, right. we maybe want to just do subdivisions that have uh, had their... Traffic study, you do projections, growth rate projections, but a good traffic consultant will look at it and say, well, there's two subdivisions in the planning process. They're not approved already. That'll give me an idea what the growth rate is in that area. So it is kind of relevant in the traffic. That's how a good traffic consultant figures out growth rate is they look at the area. And if there's two, three subdivisions in the planning process, it gives you an idea for growth rate so you can say this is what, what the traffic could be in. 
it'll be used anyway, number eight. Number five, a little harder in the drainage report or something. It's just a schematic before a planning board. You may want to look at it. I'd then say that most of these subdivisions will have no impact on this subdivision from a drainage standpoint. If there was a subdivision right next to this, I would say, geez, you know, even if it was in the early planning processes, you probably should look at it. That's your job to look at those things. That they, they were going. But we're saying look at those those subdivisions that are on the book, especially future phases and anything that's in the planning process. I would say for the transportation gives you an idea of growth rate. There is a subdevelopment that has several phases. Uh, let's see, 161 houses left to go in it uh, within a half a mile of this subdevelopment. That definitely would be included. It goes through the growth. It goes through in a traffic study. Traffic study. Yeah. I mean, you definitely want to know that these are the projections that that traffic is not going to remain the same. Just with those existing subdivisions, you know it's going to grow. Well, I mean, on the drainage phase. Yeah. The drainage, you have to take a look at. We've had some look at the watershed, so I think it's relevant to kind of look at definitely that project that has already approved projects. I want to see how they're handling drainage and how it's affecting affecting this project. So that's why it's stated in that one. So the wording <coughs> doesn't bother me. I think all you're worried about is some future project. I don't think you have any subdivisions before the planning board. Right, so I guess not on here. You're worried about those ones that have already been approved. Right. Yeah. Now, there really isn't much With that would wording, affect that area. Is now. You do have Parkside, the final phase on Parkside, that could have some effect on water. Um, other than that, you're up to Brookhaven and maybe Whistling Straits. Both of those go through Burkholz Creek. They don't come across, so that that wouldn't have much effect. So there really isn't much in that area. Yet. Pardon? <laughs> I don't think anything's on the books. He's talked to, he's talked about that several times. He wants to he wants to change the direction of the creek. <coughs> That's my whole point. That's my whole point about the planning process. Yep. What does it mean? Now, there's nothing before us that I'm aware of in that area. Mark Sean is the big one, obviously. He's safer with sticking with approved subdivisions. a little bit, but I would kind of leave those planning process ones so the guy can get an idea for growth rate. That's all he's doing is growth rate. You mean number eight? Number eight. Six. Um, if you want to change the wording on that just to make sure it's properly said to them, even if it's in the planning process, for growth rate, it'll give you an idea what the growth rate. I mean, if I'm doing growth rate in a traffic study, I'm looking at an area and saying, okay, what's planned in these areas where they're taking parcels to get an idea whether the growth rate is a half percent or one percent or two percent. But tonight we have to pass, unless we have another special meeting coming up, we have to pass a document. Yeah. We need to know what that wording is before we well, pass Bob it. Bob has the wording for number five that we'll use, including future phases. Okay. And for number eight, number eight, uh, pass for any existing approved subdivision, including future phases, comma, and subdivisions in the planning process to estimate growth rate. And then also, what are we doing about that uh, last wording, gentlemen? Well, did we take out subdivisions in the planning process in number five? In number five, yeah. Okay. If you want me to go through some motions on amendments, maybe. Well, let me ask a question yeah. then. Subdivisions and is, is Mark Shawn Estates, even though they haven't built it out, is that an approved subdivision or is that in the planning stage um, itself? It's no, that's approved. It's I know it depends. That's why I want to know what side of the fence it's on. It, it was approved at one point, but they have to redesign it because they're, when it was approved, there weren't the wetlands weren't. Yeah, in my mind, they need to know about Mark Shawn Estates, but I. I, taking not, it into consideration. I would, I would think you want to include something. You want to specifically that, name the subdivision? Well, let's name it. <laughs> but I, I, I would. But they need to know that that. I would think you want to include subdivisions. Uh, I'm trying to think of how you'd word it. Subdivisions that have been um, 
Well, the, it, Drew has it that subdivisions in the planning process before the town. That's that's certainly. I mean, if that's in the planning process, it means it's either been talked about or an application submitted or talked about in the plan. I'm not sure why we wouldn't. Leave Mr. Palumbo, it does say before the town, so it wouldn't include things that are pie in the sky. And if it's if it if hasn't come up, then it's not in the planning process. But what is the planning process? What's the planning process if somebody came in and submitted a sketch plan or whatever your first phase of subdivision review is? Process. And it's so speculative, how can you possibly analyze that? Don't you don't know if it's going to get approved? If you go on the county site, I mean, and the, 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 the street plan and everything, I think, is already proposed. You can look at street maps and the, the, the street layout for that marks on it. Oh, no, I, yeah, no, I have no problem okay. with the approved okay. ones. I'm talking about those that have not been final approved. I've but been doing. It hasn't been final approved yet. Well, we still have to go through some. And see, that's the problem. But and we have never, we have never examined subdivisions that are in the so-called planning process. Never. It's always been approved subdivisions, because otherwise it's a guess whether somebody's actually going to do it. Why don't we put Mark Shawn Estates in all its phases, and and whatever else you want to add? But you need you need to put. I think you need to name that one. <laughs> I'd be comfortable if you just name it and whatever other language you want to put in there, but you got to okay. name it. I'm comfortable with on number five, just the simple wording, now the index of any existing approved subdivisions, <coughs> including future phases, period. Uh, there's, no, there, there's, there's nothing in there that's going to affect future planning, it's going to affect drainage in that. They all have to be independently designed. But on number <coughs> eight, I, you know, that's how I've seen it done for 20 years is that Never. The gross number you have to look at all, even stuff in the planning process, because it gives you an idea of gross rate. Otherwise, how are you you're guessing at gross rate? DOT will give you a gross rate for the state highway at whatever percent, yep. but you may know that there's already all these projects that are all being talked about in an area that will give you an idea at least on future gross rate. I won't object to that language in number eight. I don't object to that in number eight. That's, that's dumb for so, yeah. so we had to estimate for growth rate. But that's for to estimate for growth rate. Right. Right. Okay. That's fine. All right. That's what the residents are concerned that all this traffic is going to build up over the years and you're not addressing yeah. it. Okay, we still have First to deal with the drainage. <coughs> you're looking at those two phases. Right. We still have to deal with the question of the uh, independent engineer or consultant or not. Does anybody have any opinions on that issue? I think Drew is recommending at this point that that, that language be removed. I, I would concur with that recommendation for a couple of reasons. Um, Are we simply killing this last note on the last page? I, I agree with what Drew is still going to hire your independent consultant that's just going to occur after they submit to the EIS. They're going to you know, give you some time to go out. Get RFPs, they want to know the cost, and get arms from consultants to say this is what we want done, and, and get somebody on board. Okay. And that'll be a lot of work when that happens. Then sitting down with you, explaining, going over, you have a lot of great questions the public do, do about drainage that make sure that you understand the drainage impacts. It's a very complicated issue. The traffic is going to be has some specific problems. And we would encourage your consultants that you use to contact our consultants and ask whatever questions they might have, any clarifications they might have. Okay, is there anything else to add to this discussion before we entertain a motion? We were going to add just one line about the stormwater. Um, about yeah. quality. Quality, stormwater quality. Okay, where's where's that going, Drew? I will put that in number four. Considering pre write conditions and address quality issues. Stormwater quality issues. And address how stormwater quality will be treated. Put a parenthesis how treated. Okay, where are you? I'm on number four. Read that all, number four. Yeah. Providing an analysis on the retention basis of limited downstream capacity during 100 year storm events. That, in addition, the analysis should be done considering pre wet conditions and address. And I'll do a separate. 
drainage the drainage report should also address stormwater quality issues and how they are treated. And the mitigations already have them looking at potentially bringing drainage to the Yes, sir. Mr. Davis. I just thought of a great concern about this uh, retention lake or retention pond, as you want to call it. Uh, normally, they're in a valley, but they're going to be like level, or if not built out the ground uh, on the houses north of, of, of Lemke uh, Drive. There are actually lower than the pond's going to be. It's okay. The new homes are going to be up in the air, but where that pond's going to go? be level, as, as I say, if not higher, than the houses north, you know, just on the north side of the street from me. My lower <laughs> lot, as soon as that thing floods, there's nowhere for the water to go. These homes, there's about six or seven homes that are going to get completely washed out. And also, if they're saying now that they, they may not take all the rooftop water and send it to there, to there and they just leave it on the ground, People on the corner of Eric, Eric Road and Lemke, they're going to get it. The school's going to get it. It's all going to come downhill to our, our guys. You know that Sawyer Creek doesn't go anywhere. So this big pond you're going to put in, you know, that thing is full already. Like Doug said, the standing water in that field right now is there now. <coughs> you dig that pond, it's going to be immediately full. You're going to have a full pond to start with. And then all this stuff is going to come. You open up all these ditches. I mean, the, the ditch on uh, Lemke Drive is not that big. A, a creek, if you want to call it a creek, it's not that wide. I mean, they could double doze that thing and widen it up and push it right through. Maybe it might help. <coughs> but my scare is the people on Lemke, they've been there 50 years. You put this pond in and it overflows, there's going to be one hell of a mess. I mean, we just saw it the other Sunday. When it freezes like this, say the uh, the overflow uh, in, in that pond freezes. Next thing we have a big rain, we have a thaw. That ice still stays underneath. It doesn't thaw. Next thing, the water's coming over the top. We'll get the water much faster than we get it now. Right now, that field slows the water down for us guys. But that 100-year storm in July, Coming out of, uh, out of Sanborn, I, I was coming down that way. The water was flooding across the Ward Road up by the, uh, the ambulance area. I got home to my house. The creek was still down. Eight hours later, that creek was the highest I've ever seen it. It was two, a foot above. I had to get all my uh, equipment out of my shed before, it, before the water got mm -hmm. in. Never come that high before. <coughs> Yeah, I think the theory
You can see Tim taking a look at it right now. Now the theory here is that's designed to hold a 100-year flood, right? Well, Tim? Well, the example, if you want, again, that went down a steep road. Now, that wasn't a major melt last Sunday. That pond already had overflowed, and it was solid water running into the ditch in front on steep road from past Which? the pavilion all the way to the baseball field. 200 yards that, that was overflowed. That pond, any pond you put in, will only hold a foot of water. I don't know how your calculations go, but I'm telling you the truth. You got a foot of water. The water retention in that property is going to take that pond and fill it right up. A foot down about lift. When they dig it in the summer, you can walk over there and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. But you know, you know yourself. So the pond on Steve Road is a prime example, and we should look at that as what's going to happen. I don't know how they calculate the pond. Well, I think this had. It's always going to be full. It's going to be like a pea pod that's seven eighths full all the time. And I know that this has more rise than one foot, but I don't know what it is. There will be a normal water elevation in the pond that will be equal to the outlet. So the outlet has to discharge to the ditch. That outlet is going to be above your normal ditch water elevation. And that outlet comes back to the pond. Wherever that outlet pipe ends, Do you want me to try to put together the motion? Yeah, I can All make right. a motion with your All right. changes. Oh, so, so I think it would be a, mo a motion to approve the fourth draft of the final scope for the draft environmental impact statement uh, for the Cobblestone Creek subdivision as amended, and I guess I'm going to try to say as follows. 
paragraph 3.04 to include that the report should also include a uh, study on the impact on the quantity and quality of water. Paragraph 3.05, change the word with to including and end the sentence at the word phases. Uh, 3.08, change the word uh, with to including in the second line from the bottom uh, and add at the end uh, to estimate growth rates. Uh, to, to estimate growth rates of subdivisions in the planning process. Um, uh, and then I think also to um, remove the final paragraph of the draft scope beginning with the, uh, the word note. Remove it outright. Remove it. With those changes, I'll make a motion that we accept the final project. We have a motion. Project. Does anybody wish to second? I'll second it. Second by Art. Moved and seconded. Anything on the question? Does anybody have anything further they want to bring up? What's the timetable on this roughly, Drew, then? What's the applicant? What's the, the typical <coughs> timetable? I don't know. I can't speak to the applicant. Okay. It could be six months. I it could be two months. It could be... So we're, we're basically in a holding pattern until they so come they back. A draft impact okay. So should we start preparing ourselves? Yeah, I would start looking for your consultant and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, gentlemen? Okay. Then if not, then uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? We have our scoping document. 